Welcome to this Singapore preview. We got a lot of stuff to look at today before this Singaporean Grand Prix. But before that, subscribe if you're new, throw me a like if you got a second, and let's get into this. So the first thing we always do is look at weather. Last year's weather was pretty high chance of rain Saturday and Sunday, particularly Sunday, and we saw a complete dry race. Now that is not uncommon for the Singaporean Grand Prix. The weather around Singapore is a crazy, a very maritime area. For this week, it looks as though complete thunderstorms from Friday already all the way to Thursday. So expect to see weather affected, but because the race is near the evening, in Singapore it usually is rainy during the day, windy and clear at night. That is a very common thing that happens, and as you can see, the evening wind pushes out the clouds, the evening wind pushes out the clouds, the evening wind pushes out the clouds. It's a, it's a pretty common thing that happens apparently in Singapore. Uh, so the two things to look out for is the high percentage of rain. Now if one of these low pressure systems and a high pressure system stall out, you can see all of this rain might be able to be pushed to a more consistent rainy weekend as you can see through tuesday through thursday of next week there it is completely rainy the whole time too big of a system to really be pushed out in the evening we'll really be looking closer to friday and saturday to figure out what's going to go on uh, i suspect that it'll be pretty hard to tell uh, but there is some pretty big systems especially early morning on friday and early morning on saturday that are really going to affect the track uh, so the worst that's going to happen, or I guess the best case scenario is it's going to rain and all the rubbering in that the track has got the previous day will be washed out and they kind of be reset. So look for first 20 minutes of free practices to be kind of not a lot of grip qualifying the uh, F, uh, Q1 session to have not a lot of grip and the first 20 minutes of the race not to have a lot of grip. So really going to be looking at those and it is a dangerous spot to not have a lot of grip. As we've seen in the past, there's some pretty terrible things that can happen. So the second thing is the wind. This is Singapore two days ago. As you can see, uh, kind of windy. <laughs> I think more crazy than normal. Uh, this doesn't, from what I've been able to decipher online about Singapore, I uh, uh, will admit I don't know much. Uh, this is not regular weather that they see. Uh, so we'll look to see a lot of debris on the track, look to see a lot of trash bags, leaves, dirt, dust, everything that's going to be affecting uh, the cars and especially seeing a crosswind that comes across and pushes cars into braking zones, really going to be wind affected. Not as much as usual because again this is a street course so all the wind is kind of blocked off by the giant walls that they put up very close to the track so a little bit more protected than usual but still the wind affected will definitely be a thing the only other thing to look for is if it does rain this is a street course the track is not good at evacuating uh rain from the track so if it is wet and singapore is really an all or nothing kind of thing it's not like it drizzles a little bit it usually downpours when it does happen so expect to see a red flag if it does actually rain because the cars can't evacuate it off because it's, again, one, slow, so a lot of that speed that they would normally use to get rid of the rain. It's very humid as well, so a lot of the track drying up isn't going to happen. It's at night, so there's no sun to dry the track. There's a lot of factors there that reasons why the rain will just stay on the track forever. So if it does rain, I, I suspect it'll be a red flag because we still have that problem where these cars, because of the downforce levels and the ground effects cars that we have, it really does suck a lot of water off the track, even more so than in previous years. And we haven't really figured out how to make that stop happening. If you remember the uh, test that they did with Ferrari, trying to figure out wheel covers kind of stuff, and we didn't really get an answer out of that. So really gonna be watching for rain. It's going to be the biggest thing this weekend. Aside from that, track changes. So last year, again, last year, they changed out this for construction. The old circuit had a right, left, left, right chicane. Uh, I wanna call it chicane. It's more like a bus stop or a swimming pool kind of the stop where it's not like a quick chicane it's a longer one uh, but they cut that off and made that straight and last year there was questions whether they would make that a drs zone or not they ended up not because there wasn't a consensus consensus over everybody whether it should have been done the drivers wanted it done and this year it looks like the race is reporting and many other news organizations that there will be a drs zone between 14 and 16. 15 really isn't a corner, it's just like a fake corner or whatever. So you'll have four DRS zones at the Singapore Grand Prix. I don't know that it'll really affect 
much. It is a tight street circuit, one of the tightest we have. Not a lot of speed. Again, it's not the slowest course in the world, but it still is a genuine street circuit, unlike Baku where it's like this crazy, the straight in Baku is almost as big as this whole friggin' circuit. So <laughs> it's really gonna be down to how this affects the cars. I think it'll probably help with uh, tire temperatures. We saw last year the Red Bull have a really hard time with tire temperatures. And let's remind ourselves what some of the previous years looked like. This was 2017. It's when the two Ferraris got past and ended up coming together. Again, this was a little bit of a wet race and huge collisions at the start of the race there. You saw tons of people being taken out. And really that first corner around Singapore is going to be nutso. This is also sort of a uh, temperature kind of place. So track temperature, very hot. Cars, very hot. Humidity, very hot. Drivers, very hot. But overall, track temperature, as far as the tires go, it's very hard to turn them on. And the only reason I say that is this was Qualifying last year, you can see down in 11th place, Max Verstappen. The 2023 car for Red Bull, the RB19, was the most dominant car in history. It has the most winningest, and when you get that feeling, aside from like uh, like stats on the track, yeah, it won the most, most in a row as well. But when you get the feeling out on track, it really was in a league of its own, and I don't believe they were pushing for most of that uh, year, that they were really kind of sandbagging a little bit, holding back some of the speed that they had. This car did not perform well at Singapore, so I can only imagine that its iteration, the RB20, would also be quite bad at Singapore. Hard to turn on tire temperatures. It doesn't like bumps. Singapore is a ridiculously bumpy track. Uh, we don't have that big bump like we used to, uh, just, just after the, uh, before or after the bridge? Can't remember. Uh, they've changed that, which I don't like. I always thought that was pretty interesting from the track. But this is a bumpy track. It has high curbs. It's hard to turn on the tire temperatures. There's tons of reasons why the Red Bull won't be good around here, and I don't believe they've solved their issues. If you believe Helmut Marko and some of the stuff that he said, which I don't necessarily because he's a pathological liar, but Austin is really the first time that they're going to be able to solve a lot of the issues coming down with the Red Bull recently. So I believe that this car will be equally as bad as it was here last year. Now, they got a little bit caught out from the tire temperatures and that made them do bad in the race. They were able to fight through a little bit, but not as much as you would like. And this is what happened to knock Verstappen out. This is Liam Lawson coming across the line, taking 10th place and knocking Max Verstappen out by 0 0.007 of a second. If it wasn't for this, I believe Max would have got into Q3 and might have been able to put together a lap that was representative. And he did fight through the field a little bit from 11th place to come in like sort of like fifth or sixth so not too bad so if he had been able to secure fifth or sixth ab above the hasses i suspect that he would have been able to fight through and been on the podium so let's not pretend that the red bull is horribly slow here but if we take everything into account i believe the other cars will be faster here ferrari looks quick although they're not as quick at slower courses you saw at austria and uh, Silverstone, they weren't very good. They're, it's kind of a windy course. Monaco, they were quite good though, so it's kind of all over the place. It depends on what's going on. Uh, I do believe they still have tire temperature issues. They solved them from previous years past, but solved them to become good, not solved them to become great. So uh, I believe it'll all be down to tire temperatures and who can turn them on when they need to, aside from possibly weather. So look for efficient cars here to be good as well. The McLaren will be good, the Haas will be good, the Williams will be good, Ferraris technically should be good, and cars that were previously bad at Baku will also be quite bad. You'll see um, the Sauber's not be good, uh, the uh, uh, the RBs will not be good, and uh, I suspect Austin Martin probably won't be very good, although Alonso is excellent around this track. He's proven in the past that he can win around here. So this is what happened during the race. Again, Verstappen and Perez were out of sync to everybody else. They started on the hard rather than the medium from everybody else, and they did not pit when the safety car came out early on in the race. They were trying to get to the very front of the field when that came out, when everybody else made their pit stop. But because they were so far behind and actually not that fast in race pace, uh, they couldn't get out in front of Sainz. So they couldn't control the pace when the, the race restarted, and they ended up falling down the order quite badly. 
then another safety car came out and they had already pitted and what happened is they came out in 14th and 17th as a result of that they weren't able to fight through the field very well this was the only race last year in my opinion that the red bull looked incredibly weak so i don't suspect that this year they will look like a strong form although you never know so that's what happened during the race and then what ended up happening is the mercedes pitted to for tires and giving up uh, track position they pushed all the way to the front got really close to norris and it looked like he was going to pass but carlos Sainz, in his smooth operator mode pushed lando norris back gave him the drs and allowed him to use that as a defense from the two mercedes thus saving Sainz and ultimately saving norris for the win uh, for the second place and this was kind of the first time that we really saw the mclarens be very strong piastri didn't finish very well he didn't he started way way down in the order he didn't get through q1 uh, due to not putting a lap in so he was able to push through into eighth and you can see verstappen in sixth there so uh piastri did an excellent job pushing through even though he was out of sync and so far down so this was really a good result from both of them this is the biggest thing for me though the flexi mini flexi wing from mclaren now i will preface this by saying that flexible wings and flexible aerodynamic elements in formula one has been a thing for probably 20 or 30 years i want to say like the mid 90s when they were really getting heavy heavy into aerodynamic stuff but even into the original ground effects cars they understood that body work does flex under load when you're moving around and so this is not a new thing everybody who hasn't been around probably has forgot that we have gone through several iterations of aerodynamic cheating in through the year but this is what happens to the car basically what uh, the race has said and from mark hughes is, is that it's sneaky but ultimately legal instagram not a place i usually go to to check out uh formula one stuff doesn't really matter he is at uh, 280 kilometers an hour so everything's all lined up and at 320 kilometers an hour that aerodynamic load from the back of the wing ends up opening this flap i believe that's how that works it's actually pushing down and opening up the outsides and allowing a little bit of a flap inside there so it seems as though this is going to be legal and just to remind everybody don't really worry what this guy's saying but this is the red bull from years past and you can see under load that rear wing becoming not a rear wing anymore basically flattening itself out a whole bunch under load like that is a significant amount compared to the competitor in the mercedes there which barely moves at all what happened last time is they gave them a certain amount of time made a technical directive and they had to replace their wings and not do that anymore will that happen this year i'm not really sure we're really close to the end of the year it's really not that kind of stuff doesn't happen that close to the end of the year because you really have to give if you're going to say that something has changed or introduce a new way of testing you have to give teams time to be able to mitigate that uh, last year we saw the uh, austin martin and their flexi wing and their um, rolled wing that you saw from them uh, it's difficult to explain but they basically cheated the way that the rules said to make the edge have a really rolled e edge there in their rear wing and there was some flexi wing stuff going on from them so this year it really seems like the mercedes and the mclaren are doing the same kind of flexi wing stuff also in their front wings as well so the load test they do is a static load test it's not anything done at speed they might introduce something like that i know in the front wing now they use little dots and as the dots come closer together they're able to tell how much load is going on there maybe they'll do something similar for the time being though it looks like whatever wing is going on there is fairly legal and it doesn't look like there's going to be much uh clarification from the fia when it comes to that so mclaren appears to be winning the cheaty aerodynamics game that's going on previously red bull has done really well at that they don't have the master of adrian Newey anymore to come up with their own ideas so hard to say what they're going to do about it i think really what's going on with the red bull right now is these teams are pushing forward in trickery and the red bull right now is just trying to fix their floor they're not trying to push forward and make the car faster well they are but they're mostly trying to fix the drivability of the car because their wheel spin in 
medium to low speed corners is appalling. Their drive out of corner, corners is almost as bad as Ferrari was last year. Uh, it's really going to be hard for them to catch up and then pass everybody who is already pushing forward before the end of the year. They're going to hope that Mercedes, Ferrari, and McLaren all make a bad left turn on their aerodynamics game. The likelihood of all three of those teams doing that is pretty low. One team, maybe. All three, unlikely. So that's what's going on with aerodynamics. The only other news that we saw was that Sergio Perez's father ended up in the hospital after Sergio had a cra had the crash in Baku. Uh, he did mild cardio infraction. I'm not sure if it was a full heart attack or not, but it seems I'm not very good at translating Spanish, so it's hard to tell what was actually going on there, but uh, he seems to be hospitalized and he's in stable condition. But keep in mind, stable condition doesn't necessarily mean you're out of the woods. It just means you're not getting any worse. So if he was already in a pretty bad state, he continues to be in a bad state. Uh, I haven't heard any more news, but it would be good to see him fully recover. He is an epic figure in the uh, paddock, almost as much as Mass's father was. Always great to see um, those uh, Jensen Button's father as well, uh, Lewis Hamilton's father, all those support figures that we get used to seeing in there. It would be a terrible thing not to see Antonio there every weekend cheering on his son. And I really feel for Perez, sometimes this kind of stuff can really affect you in the races as well. So bad for him and his family. I, I hope uh, Antonio does recover. So uh, this is another thing I'd want to reiterate how good Colapinto has done in two races. He's done four times as good as Logan Sargent in 37 races. And you can't say that Logan Sargent didn't have a chance because Albon put in many points as well. So looks as though Colapinto is earning his race seat. And I want to reiterate that cutthroatness from Williams really does seem to be paying off. Not sure what's up with Logan Sargent. I assume he will be moving to maybe an IndyCar seat because keep in mind, being the worst driver in Formula One still means you're a pretty good race driver. So there's there's nothing to be said about Logan Sargent. It's not like me or uh, the regular kind of person would be able to walk out and do what Logan Sargent has done for the past two seasons. He's excellent, just not as excellent as some of the other drivers that are on offer. And because of that, it looks as though James Valls would be okay with giving up Colapinto in 2025 if he cannot offer him anything other than a technical third support driver seat. Now, not necessarily a bad idea to be a support driver at Williams. It seems as though if things go bad, uh, they wouldn't mind putting their third driver in the car. However, I think Albon and Carlos are probably some of the strongest drivers on the grid, especially in comparison to what team they'll be driving for. So I can't see any reason other than injury or illness getting them out of that seat next year or in 2026. So if I were called Pinto, I would go for the Audi drive that he seems to be in contention for. Bortoletto is the other one that we seem to see be able to go to Audi as a younger driver. We still don't know what Audi is going to do. Are they going to go with 2026 being a full development year? We're going to take that whole year and really concentrate on developing the car. Or are they confident enough to make a push for the championship or at least to be really high in the standings? Hasn't happened in a long time since Braun in 2009. And again, that was a very, very circumstantial thing. They actually had a winning car delivered to them for one pound in the Honda car. So... It's been a long time since a car uh, team has shown up, been good, and won all in the same kind of uh, breath. I would suggest if it were me, I wouldn't take a young driver. I would petition Sebastian Vettel to drive for me because he is an excellent car developer and so is Nico Hulkenberg. Both of them, regardless of how they do in the races, can show up, give good feedback, and make you fast for 2027. That's what I would do. But if you're going to go for a young driver and... This is the other strategy. Have one good development driver in Nico Hulkenberg who can give you good results as far as uh, what your car is doing that year to develop for the next year. And also teach a young guard. Colapinto would probably be one of my cho uh, choices just because of his experience this year. If Colapinto hadn't have gotten in the car this year, I probably would have chose Bortoletto because over one lap, that man seems kind of crazy. He did go from last to first, which is 
never really happened before in F2, so uh, there's something to be said from him. Also, there's the likes of Lawson, Hajar, there's tons of people to choose from, and I really do hope that they go with a young driver um, instead of maybe a paid driver. I would be disappointed if Botas or Zhao stay on, uh, because I believe Botas's time is over. Uh, he is good as a development driver, but I would rather see somebody else who's better at that show up. I am a Botas fan. I have his calendar in my room and his ass is in my face all day long. I just bought it because it was funny, but you know, <laughs> it's there. Uh, it upsets uh, my son and wife <laughs> and my father when he comes over. So uh, I am a Botas supporter, 100%, uh, but I would rather see either maybe a Vettel or even Mick Schumacher in the car if you want a development driver. But really, seeing those young drivers come into the cars and giving them a shot is really what we want to do. Okay, so that's pretty much the video. Thanks for joining me. Again, look out for the weather and the track changes as far as um, straight line speed goes. Really, the weather is going to depend on a million different things, and I think it's going to be the Hail Mary kind of oddball of what's going on this weekend. We could end up seeing some crazy, crazy stuff. Subscribe if you're new. Throw me a like if you got a second, and I'll see you guys for Friday practice.